Okay. Welcome to St. Thomas Church. We are so glad that you are here. If you are joining online, thank you for attending. Uh, we are joined this morning, uh, Dan is on vacation, so uh, Holly Gaynor is here to preach. She has preached before, and there's a, a little bit of a blurb in, the, uh, in your bulletin that uh, gives a little bit of background of and I see at the very, I'm not going to read it since you can read it for yourself, but it, it does say at the end here that Holly is also a cousin of John Hanawalt. So please try not to hold that against her. <laughs> she can't help it. So anyway, so um, again, thank you all for attending. Uh, a lot going on today. Uh, my friend Steve Schwartz is here, so I, I imagine he's going to talk about uh, Christian Churches United, which is an affiliate of ours uh, as part of our outreach program here at St. Thomas. So without further ado, can we start by joining each other in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you yet again for another day, another day that we can gather together and come to you in worship and praise. We come together to encourage one another as the body of Christ, to help each other in our own individual and our collective walk with you. We pray for a blessing on this service. We pray that it give us renewal, that it deepens our faith, strengthens our obedience, and magnifies our love for you and each other. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And now, will you join me in our call to worship? Oh, thank you for standing. I didn't even ask you to. <laughs> Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Who forgives all your sins and heals your diseases and crowns you with love and compassion. So that your life is renewed like the eagles. Will you join us now in singing the hymn, Come Thou Font? It is in your red hymnal on uh, it's number 476, or you can take the lazy way and look at the monitors. <laughs>
Because yeah. there's two different places. One is still yeah. the two smart. More than one set of instructions sometimes makes it difficult. <coughs> This morning, we all have things to share with God that basically are confessions of things that we know we have done that weren't the right thing, that weren't the best thing. So let's take a few moments and pull those up from our heart into our spirit. Now join with me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And together again, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I'd like to invite any of our children or young, young at heart uh, to come forward and join me. If you need to bring your adult, that's okay too. So we can just have a little bit of time of conversation up here. Not feeling it? That's okay, too. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a question. Are you, are you back in school yet? Are in your, are you, do you go to school? Yeah. Does your school have some rules? Does anybody else remember being in school and you had, you had some rules? And, and, and who, who made those rules? The school board was part of those rules. Who else? Teacher, the principal. You had a bunch, of, you had a lot of different kind of folks involved in making that. Why, why did you have to have a rule in the first place, though? I mean, didn't you already kind of know what you had to sort of do when you were there anyway? Well, maybe you didn't. <laughs> you want to make sure everybody is included in that, in the uh, understanding of what that, of what it's going to be like to be in this community as a school. So if you're not in school yet, but maybe you might start soon, you might be part of helping to maybe make the rules that are part of your classroom, that are part of the way your class is going to take care of each other. Maybe you're going to have a kid who can't have peanuts in the room, and so your class has to wash their hands or be careful how they pack their lunch or how you sit at the lunch table to keep that person safe in your classroom. Or maybe you're going to have a rule about how you line up to go to other places in the building or how, to, or how you should respond and who you should listen to if there's some kind of emergency in your, in your school, like the fire bell or something. And so we need those rules to help protect us and keep us safe. But what if you went to school and the rule was, you have glasses and so you have to sit on the right-hand side. And if you don't have glasses, you get to sit on the left. Well, the rule would make sense if maybe the people on the left had better vision and the people on the right don't, and so maybe there's something on that side that helps them to see better. But if everybody is looking at the same thing in the front, that rule doesn't really make any sense. And maybe it's not a rule that needs to be followed, and maybe it's a rule somebody needs to say something about and say, you know, this rule doesn't really work for us. Like, that might have worked when we used to have our classroom set up a certain way, but that rule doesn't work 
now, and maybe we need to fix that because it seems sort of silly to have to separate ourselves according to what we need to be able to see. I'd like you to listen real closely to the gospel reading that's going to be shared today. Jesus talks about what it means to follow the rules and when it's okay to sometimes break the rules and question them and ask for them to be adapted. Let's say a prayer. God, in the life of Jesus, you broke all the rules and conquered death, and we thank you for your willingness to break that rule and bring us into salvation with you. Be with us as this new school year begins and help us to follow all the rules in the best way possible. But when it's time to ask a question, to be bold and willing to also ask a question. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Sue. And thank you, Betsy. A good reminder that when God asks something of us, he raises us up to do it. Which brings us to today's first scripture from Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. This chapter is headed the call of Jeremiah, and in it you will see perhaps fleetingly why Jeremiah is known as the reluctant prophet. But other sources of, or names of scriptures might say it, making your life count, or God has a job for you. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, so sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. Uh, sources have him at 17 years old. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Our second scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, page 1486 in your Bible. This healing story, Jesus wants us to have a life in all its fullness and sets us free from all that holds us captive, whether it be ill health, uh, human attitudes, and judgments. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. The word of God for our good. Good morning. It is good to be with you today, and I thank Pastor Dan for offering this opportunity to share with you and to worship with you. As said previously, my name is Holly Gaynor. I am the 32-year wife of Ray, the mom of three adult children, and yes, the cousin to John and Patty and Tina and Jim and Linda and many others in the Hannah Walt clan. <laughs> they must claim me, but I joyfully claim them all. <laughs> so. I am also a seminarian at United Lutheran Seminary, uh, finishing a degree of Master of Arts. Um, and I'm, again, grateful to have this time to be with you. The creation story is found twice in the Bible. Once in Genesis 1 and then again in Genesis 2. And while the chronology differs a bit for each, the general theme 
of creation being God's work, of creation being made in God's image, and of creation being a good thing is repeated in both versions. Who's the boss? God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. The Ten Commandments are found twice in the Old Testament too, once in Exodus and once in Deuteronomy. The wording for each is nearly identical, and the fourth commandment, would anyone like to dig back into your Bible study or your catechism confirmation class brain and remind us the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Both Old Testament texts recall the story of the Israelites having left Egypt, of coming to Mount Sinai, and of being consecrated before God. Both recall God speaking to Moses and revealing to him the covenants intended to bind them to the divine. Both texts use several chapters to detail a wide range of laws and the consequences for breaking them. Laws about the altar, about slaves, about violence, property, restitution, the tabernacle, priests, the adornment of priests. God wants to be in relationship with the Israelites. He loves them and he wants to covenant with them. And the climax of this dramatic revelation of God is reached when Moses is given two stone tablets engraved by God's very own hand with the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the law. But that fourth commandment, it's not defined beyond saying to keep the Sabbath. It does not specifically say what work actually is or isn't. The beauty of the fourth commandment is that it's offered as a way to mirror God's action in the creation story. Work with holy diligence, rest with holy joy. God is in the work and in the rest. God's image is present in creation. Creation is a blessing, and we are part of that creation. Who's the boss? Still God. But the invitation has been extended to God's people to be in relationship with the divine to be a part of it, an invitation to holy living and community, an invitation to holy purpose and rest. Somewhere between the time Moses receives the Ten Commandments and the time of our gospel reading this morning from Luke, when Jesus restores a woman who had suffered for 18 years over 600 addendums were added to that fourth commandment. Additions that were meant to refine what the definition of work actually meant. The day of rest, still important, still necessary, but it was a much more difficult task for the Israelites. The requirements for what was work and what was rest were very detailed and included Details such as the assurance that watering your donkey and other animals that supported your livelihood was okay. But healing a non-life-threatening condition on the Sabbath day was not. That was forbidden. That's the context that we are in as we read this text from Luke our Protestant 21st century vantage point can skew our understanding of that and maybe not pick some of the nuance out of what Jesus is saying and doing in this short passage we read. Our view of Sabbath rest differs greatly from what our spiritual ancestors 2,000 years ago had. We know Jesus to be a man faithful to his Jewish heritage and culture, a man who kept the Sabbath holy 
just as the woman who was bent over did. They are both actually doing what they know to do, worship and rest on the Sabbath. The leader of the synagogue likely knew both of them. He too was a faithful Jew and the product of a long line of temple leadership dedicated to the upkeep and the running of the temple. Those roles were hereditary. I think it's important to remember that, to remember that the people who have gathered around Jesus on this Sabbath have come with all the rituals of ancient Jewish life. They are descendants of Abraham. They are the people from whom and for whom Jesus was born. While keeping 600 laws in check would likely be an everyday exercise in tremendous anxiety for me personally, I like to humor myself and think I would have been trying to do so if our places in history were reversed. Who's the boss? Sort of feels like the temple leader and the laws. At least until Jesus catches sight of this unnamed woman suffering from a condition for 18 years that has left her bent over and unable to stand up. Have you ever been bent over and unable to easily stand up? He calls to her and proclaims liberation. Woman, you are set free of your ailment. And with the simple touch of his hand, her condition is healed. And she stands straight up. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. How utterly amazing. What a glorious moment it must have been. Imagine being her neighbor, her friend, her relative, her companion in faith that gathered weekly in the temple for worship and praise. Imagine knowing that she had suffered for 18 years. And then imagine seeing her set free from her ailment by the command and the simple touch of Christ right there in front of you with your very own eyes. How would you have responded to such a miracle? Would you tell Jesus to take it back because tomorrow is not the Sabbath and that is the appropriate day for this action? Would you be inclined to keep the news a secret and kind of hold it close to you because this is law-breaking of the first degree? Would you hush her joy when she began to praise God, her spontaneous response to the spirit that's been laid on her? Because this is a house of worship and we don't do that here. Or maybe you would just be confused and wonder what just happened? Who's the boss? Jesus Christ, born, crucified, died, risen, seated at the right hand of the Father. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says what I previously quoted, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. In Luke, we see Jesus living into this proclamation and have no doubt this is holy embodied liberation. Jesus boldly navigates those in the temple that day through the space between law and grace. Jesus boldly asks, why would we give life-saving water to an animal on the holy day, but not life-saving health to the human? Jesus boldly stands between the shame and the anger of his opponents and the joyful praise of the woman and the crowd around them. 
It is not the first time, nor will it be the last, that Jesus owns the whole thing like a boss. And as my net notes on netbible.org said, Jesus argues that no other day is more important to heal a descendant of Abraham than the Sabbath. The exact opposite view of the synagogue leader. The woman's battle was not with the law. This is a battle between Satan and God. As I shared with the children earlier, or tried to, sometimes the rules we have are hard to follow, but we need them there to give us the framework to function as a community and as a society. As citizens in this country, we rely on laws to govern the way we live and to set standards for us to hold. Jesus reminds us that God's law is over and above that standard and that the Sabbath was always made for humans. Humans weren't made so they could run around following 600 rules. When we impose our own interpretation of law on one another, which we are prone to do, Jesus says the standard we should hold is compassion. When we insist on deciding who is in and who is out, Jesus says the standard is grace. And when we point one finger out, while the rest are pointing back at us, we are reminded that all fall short of the glory of God and forgiveness and restoration are not only possible, but spirit-filled efforts worth pursuing. It requires yielding our bent out of shape nose to the great I am so that it can be molded back into something holier, more righteous. Jesus challenges us to both follow the rules and be willing to adapt our understanding of them. God is always the boss. We are always the support staff. When we confuse those two things, it will not go well for us. Seeking the kingdom of God is always the top priority among the LGBTQIA community, among racial and cultural divide, among religious differences. God is always the boss. God's finger engraved the Ten Commandments, not mine and not yours. As people of faith, we claim victory over the grave through Jesus Christ. We wash ourselves in baptismal waters. We eat our fill at the banqueting table. We live our lives knowing that our faith is a grace-given gift of God. The cross reminds us that we did not earn it. We could never earn it. But that we need not fear that reality Jesus stands between us and death. He stands between death and life. And he claims eternal life for us. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. H-O-L-Y. But keep it holy too. W H O. L L Y. Thanks be to God for being the boss of me and the boss of you. Amen. Excuse me. 
Please join me in a uh, moment of prayer for as we pray for each of us and one another. Dear Gracious Father, we come to you with thanks for the many blessings you give us every day. We ask you to continue to watch over us and protect us. Please be with those that are on our prayer list, whether it is physical or spiritual needs. We ask you to provide a special blessing. Please provide this blessing to Sharon, Loretta, George, Tanya, Sue, Kathy, Linda, Larry, Pat, and Gail. And please be with the family of Earl Hinkle as they deal with this difficult time. This request we ask in your name. Amen. And also, if you would, uh, as we recite together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is kingdom, and power, and glory. to uh, switch the two uh, <coughs> next uh, topics. We're going to do our offerings first and then have our mission moment. So uh, uh, we have the opportunity to provide support for the church in many ways and uh, one of them is obviously through monetary giving. Uh, there's offering plates at the uh, side of the pews. Uh, for giving uh, offering on your way out. There's also through the portal. You can uh, donate through the portal or you can also mail in your support to the church office and it's all greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. Would you please join me in a prayer blessing for these offerings? Lord, you provide so many blessings in, we, in return, we try to do your will by sharing our talents, our time, and our monetary support so that this church can continue to serve you. Please bless these gifts so they can be used in the best possible way to do your will. This we ask in your name. Amen. <laughs> to invite Wanda Schaefer and Steve Schwartz uh, for our mission moment. Good morning. Um, as you know, the community impact team each month has been trying to get you a little bit more information on all the missions that we support. And each month we have a different mission. This month is Christian Churches United. And we're very, very fortunate to have Steve Schwartz from Christian Churches United to tell us a little bit about what they've been up to um, and what opportunities are out there for us. Thank you, Wanda. Um, first of all, my apologies to anyone who sat on this side of the sanctuary. If you're six foot five, you shouldn't sit in the front row <laughs> in front of the screen. Um, I sat down during the first hymn. I, I might do that at the end, too, that out of courtesy. But uh, greetings from everyone at Christian Churches United. We're, I'm so excited we can be here together today. And I also want to bring greetings from our network. Uh, you are a part of over 100 local churches that make up Christian Churches United and that do this ministry together. Of those 100 plus, church, 100 plus churches, 12 of them are United Church of Christ congregations. 
but there are also Lutheran, Brethren in Christ, United Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, uh, historically African American churches, Catholic churches, Episcopal churches, Mennonite Church of the Brethren, many independent churches. And so, um, you know, in these times when there's so much division in our world, uh, even in, in uh, Christian circles around theological issues or political issues or whatever they are, I just think it's a, it's a wonderful testimony of the church coming together around issues that we can agree on to love our neighbors, to live out Jesus' command to love our neighbors, to care for those that are facing homelessness, poverty, other crises in their life, or incarceration. And that is what Christian Churches United has been, around, been all about for the past 45 years, bringing Christians together and churches together along with other concerned people in the community to work on these issues. Um, one of those neighbors that we have supported, uh, just to give you an example of the type of work that you are all a part of doing, uh, is named Pearl. Pearl is uh, 70 years old, just to give you some perspective. Um, she had a very rough life. Um, she was one of 12 siblings. Her parents were first cousins and um, came from a very dysfunctional kind of family background. And because her parents were first cousins, all 12 kids had various special needs. Um, and as soon as she was old enough to leave home, she left home. She got into a bad relationship, an abusive relationship. Um, she actually suffered a gunshot wound as she uh, fled that man with, her, with their baby. Um, and so um, Pearl just had many, many challenges over her life. We met her about a year and a half ago. Um, she had come to the emergency room downtown Harrisburg after being assaulted and severely injured. Um, she was living with her daughter, but her daughter's boyfriend um, took out his anger on her for some reason. And she ended up in the emergency room with two black eyes, a broken wrist, and other injuries. And after she was kind of uh, provided with some help, she needed a place to stay. And so she was directed to our women's shelter that we run downtown at Grace United Methodist Church. Uh, it's a winter shelter that we run from December through March. Um, it's funded in part by our Joy to the Bird Christmas Project, which uh, some of you are aware of. Uh, it was actually opened the week of Christmas 2019 as a new shelter in Harrisburg with funding from Joy to the Bird. And so she showed up, but she showed up after hours and the doors were locked. But thankfully there was one of our volunteers outside and encountered her and said, we, you know, we're, we're not going to leave you out here. Got her inside, introduced her to the staff. And um, that temporary shelter, just a place to sleep at night, became her home for a few weeks. Uh, and her kindness and her spirit of gratitude really impacted everyone. Um, and she really got to know everyone. There was one night a few weeks later she didn't show up and everyone was concerned. They actually got the police out looking for her. Turns out she had slipped and fallen on some ice and needed to be back in the emergency room for one night, but then she was back the next day. What happened then was our staff, who uh, helped run the shelter, really started working with Pearl. So it was a temporary place to go off the street, but then we started working with her on long-term goals. And uh, we helped her get into actually a hotel uh, when the shelter closed at the end of March, uh, because we, we only run that shelter for the winter as extra shelter space in Harrisburg. So we helped her get into a hotel for a few months uh, that we paid for um, a, a, as continued kind of temporary shelter. And then our staff worked with her on all kinds of issues, taking her to doctor's appointments, uh, therapy to deal with some of the trauma she'd been through, uh, doctor's appointments following up on her injuries. Um, and then uh, they were looking for permanent housing. And a place came up at a permanent housing place locally and she didn't want to go there um, because she had a friend that lived there and they were having a bed bug problem right there and she was just really nervous about going there. And so our staff was kind of like, oh, we finally found a place. but praying about it, what to do, and the very next day, uh, another opening came up at a new senior housing community in Harrisburg called Paxton Place. And uh, she was able to move in there a few weeks later. And so Pearl's been there now over a year. Uh, actually, she just had her 70th birthday this past week, because uh, I saw pictures on Facebook of our, some of our staff taking her out to eat, or no, they had a party, I guess they had a party for her there at, the, uh, at Paxton Place. Uh, she's doing very well, and one of our staff members said, you know, I used to lay awake at night worrying about Pearl, wor worrying where she was during the day, uh, how she was doing, um, and she said, Pearl has faced a lot of hardship in her life, but now she's safe, she's warm, she's well cared for, um, and now this is her time of life to have some peace and well-being. 
going forward. So this is the type of work we do, you know, connecting with people that have been through some really hard things in their life um, and, and trying to be there for them and walking alongside them. This is the type of things that your support does and, and allows us to do and helps us to do. One other big thing, just to let you know, we've been doing through the pandemic has been what we call homeless prevention work, which is helping people. We, we historically have always done this, helping people that might be in a tough spot, like say there's a working poor family that's kind of just getting by, but then the car breaks down. Uh, they have to fix the car so they can keep going to work. Some things snowball, they can't pay their rent, and now they're, being, they're in threat of being evicted. And so if we can help them resolve that situation with some, some rental assistance to get caught up and not become homeless and not lose all their belongings and not go into a shelter and not have to take a year to get back on their life and avoid the trauma that that is for kids to go through all of that. So historically, we've worked with um, you know, 150 to 200 families a year with that type of support. Um, during the pandemic, we've helped uh, about 2,500 families in the past year and a half. So that kind of helped us. The, the need for it just skyrocketed when everything shut down. <laughs> Oops, sorry. When, er when everything, that, that was a dramatic effect. No, um, uh, but the need for that kind of help just really skyrocketed when the economy and the business world and everything shut down for a while. Um, and so we were really blessed that a lot of the stimulus money that came into Dalton County to do that kind of work, uh, Dalton County asked us to, to be one of their key partners in helping to distribute those funds. So um, we normally wouldn't have had the ability to ramp up that quickly and do that much more work, but um, there was some short-term funding available. But it was being, uh, being able to be there at the right time in the right place and being prepared as, a, as an organization. And it's interesting because our founding was really uh, 50 years ago uh, this summer was Hurricane Agnes, which was a major flood in this area that was very devastating. So I'm sure some of you remember it. Um, and it was coming out of that flood, churches rallied together and created a big fund uh, to help flood victims, which they ran for many years. And it was in running that flood emergency fund in the 70s that they started having discussions about, we should be doing this on an ongoing basis, we should be a little more organized about it. And that's when the discussions started that became Christian Churches United by the late 70s. So. So we weren't in existence during Hurricane Agnes, but it was one of the sparks, uh, a crisis situation where the church rallied that led to uh, CCU being, being um, who it is today. So thank you for your support of all of these things. I know you've also been involved in some of our prison ministry work, hosting br uh, community connection breakfasts at times in the past. Um, and thank you for the support of our uh, Joy to the Bird Christmas project. Um, Ray Wright has been on the album a couple times. We're really thankful for everyone that has helped support that. Uh, Christmas album project which happens it's now our fourth year coming up and the funding from that goes specifically to support the women's shelter another men's shelter and then other street outreach work like helping Joy um, with longer term trying to help her find um, I'm sorry Pearl um, I, I called her Joy because that's her last name one of the really cool parts of the story was after I heard her whole story and she's so gracious and filled with gratitude after all she's been through um, and I'm sitting there and all these parts of her life are tied to the Joy to the Bird project. At the very end, I said, um, you have to fill out this form to sign your name to give us permission to tell your story in the newsletter. And I said, what's your last name? And she said, Joy. And I, I just teared up as I was telling my wife the story because I just felt it was so fitting. So sorry, I, sometimes I call her Joy by accident, but her name is Pearl. <laughs> Pearl Joy is her name. Um, so lastly, just ways that you can be involved, uh, just to let you know your ongoing financial and prayer support is so vital uh, to what we do. So thank you for your support as a congregation and as individuals in the congregation. Thank you for those of you who sponsored Kevin when he did the walk, our, our uh, fundraiser walk in the spring the last couple of years. Um, one of the specific things we do if you're ever looking for a project is for someone like Pearl, who's getting an apartment, or a family that's been in a shelter and maybe doesn't have a lot of uh, belongings, we put together what's called a welcome home kit. It's a starter kit of, it's a kitchen trash can and a laundry basket and then they're filled with all kinds of cleaning supplies and toiletries and toothbrushes and band-aids and just everything to kind of help, toilet paper, paper towels, to kind of help them get started in their new apartment. So if you're ever looking for a project for a Sunday school class or a VBS or a workplace, um, uh, also just for a family or individuals do them sometimes. I have flyers in the lobby that uh, can tell you about how to put together welcome home kits. Um, and lastly, if you'd like to get involved in Joy to the Berg, I'm looking for a few volunteers that would be interested in helping to coordinate. Uh, we have a, a lot 
uh, the, the project's really growing and we need some more volunteers just on committees helping to run Joy to the Bird uh, in some administrative ways. Um, also, we need some people to help um, find sponsors uh, from churches and businesses, and we also need some people to help, with, help us with all the contacts we make to churches in the fall, um, getting CDs and getting um, uh, things out to them so they can promote it in their church. So, um, so, yeah, if you have any interest in any of those things, feel free to talk to me. I'll be here at the end. But, again, I just want to share my, my uh, appreciation on behalf of CCU for all that you do. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me today. We want to thank Steve for coming and sharing with that. Um, we're proud to be associated with that. And as he said, he's going to be here afterwards. If you have any questions for him or you want to volunteer for something, just stop out here in the foyer. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bill Miller. I serve as president of the consistory here at St. Thomas. Welcome to each and every one of you. No matter who you are, no matter where you are in our walk of life, you're welcome here at St. Thomas to pray to our boss and to receive spiritual guidance. A little bit of upcoming events and messages for you today. There will be a memorial service here on Wednesday at 11 a.m. for Earl Henkel. Please keep Missy and Earl's family in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, join St. Thomas Friends for Fellowship and Live Music next Saturday, August 27th from 6 to 8.30 at the Castle Vineyard. That's on 80 Shetland Drive in Hummelstown. It's right off of Route 39. And that's from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Bring a chair, a snack, and check out the food truck. Next Sunday, on August the 28th, for all you children that are going back to school, we're going to have a blessing of the backpacks. Uh, we'll also be preparing backpacks that day to go out to students in need. Supplies have been donated. Backpacks are still needed 
If you'd like to donate one, it can be dropped off at the church office or brought on August the 28th. Uh, some sad news that came to us the, this morning. Uh, if you remember back over the holidays, there was a young man that sang here with our choir during the cantata. He also sang about two or three weeks ago at our last outdoor service. His name is Josh Coble. We received word that Josh passed away on Friday of uh, unexpected causes. We're not 100% sure of any other information, but please keep Josh's family and him in your prayers. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out today. It's wonderful to see everybody here at St. Thomas. Have a great week. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.